the link is same for everyone yeah it's just starting now so i'll just begin yeah. namaste and good afternoon greetings from all of us at apollo hospitals this is dr srinidhi chidambaram and i'm very happy to see you all again as you know, Apollo Hospitals has always been at the forefront in creating health awareness. And with our numerous Facebook live sessions, we have been bringing to you authentic information on diseases, path breaking treatments, latest technologies, and medical innovations. A diagnosis of cancer can be challenging for anyone, but it can prove easier if you are fully aware of the facts about the condition and the best available latest options for treatment before choosing the way ahead. There have been amazing innovations and transformative technology that has made cancer treatment extremely refined, targeted, and precise. The surgical treatment of cancers, traditionally by open techniques, used to have a lot of side effects and delayed recovery, but now we have robotic surgery, which on the other hand, provides ultimate flexibility and precision for exceptional surgical outcomes in cancer surgery, giving very high definition and magnified vision instruments with extreme degrees of freedom, enabling the surgeon to use them in very narrow, confined spaces, accessing difficult to reach cancers. In cancer surgery, robotic techniques also enable even a very major radical operation to be performed with preservation of nearby nerves and vital structures. So it is indeed worth knowing about what exactly is robotic surgery and also its role in cancer treatment. To explain this concept to us, I am absolutely delighted to welcome Dr. Venkatesh Munikrishnan, who is consultant colorectal and robotic surgeon Clinical Lead Institute of Colorectal Surgery, Apollo Hospitals, Chennai. With an MRCS, Edinburgh FRCS, General and Colorectal Surgery, and CCT from the UK, Dr. Venkatesh Munikrishnan has the distinction of having the highest volumes of robotic colorectal cancer surgery in India. And he has one of the busiest specialist, subspecialist colorectal practices for a single surgeon in India. He established a fully functional gastrointestinal group practice at the Apollo Hospital in 2017. He is the program chair for the Apollo International Colorectal Symposium, having conducted it successfully for many years now, and co-chair Apollo Hospital's Cleveland Clinic University College uh, London Hospital Colorectal Collaboration. He's also honorary senior, senior lecturer in surgery, UCL, and examiner Royal College of Surgeons Edinburgh in the UK. His area of expertise is considerable in different types of robotic and laparoscopic colorectal surgery, cancer surgery, and also in uh, surgery for uh, bowel conditions like inflammatory bowel disease, proctology, therapeutic colonoscopy, all kinds of emergency abdominal surgeries, and daycare surgery. Welcome, Dr. Venkatesh Munikrishnan. Thank you so much for joining this show. And I uh, join you in uh, welcoming you. And I'm sure that your insights are going to be extremely valuable to our readers so that they will know all about robotic surgery and its role in cancer care at the end of the session. Thank you, Dr. Srimati. So let's begin by, first of all, uh, maybe quickly go through uh, why, where is uh, the role of surgery in cancer? And then we can go on to what is new and what is special about robotic surgery. Sure. So uh, as far as cancer is concerned, I'm going to stick to colorectal cancer or GI cancers. The primary, primary role is going to be surgery. But again, in different parts of the uh, gastrointestinal system, uh, for example, esophagus, uh, rectum, uh, sometimes in pancreas, you can give other treatment modalities such as chemo and radiation to sort of improve the outcomes or uh, you know, downstage the disease. So coming further into my area of expertise, which is colorectal cancer, uh, for rectal cancer in particular, it's very standardized. Uh, surgery is the main role of treatment, but we use chemo and radiation uh, uh, routinely to downstage these tumors. What we've learned over the years is that uh, 
we can improve on the outcomes. Surgery obviously gives the best result, but we can improve even if it's 5%, 10% more improvement can be done with using other modalities as adjuncts like chemo and radiation to improve the outcomes. So for example, but in colon, colon cancer, for example, uh, usually treatment is just surgery upfront and then based on the stage, you, you know, give further treatment. But in rectal cancer, we need to identify the stage. Most of the time, particularly in our patient population, they will need chemo and radiation to start with to downstage the disease and followed by surgery in due course. Uh, so before the advent of robotic surgery, uh, was it uh, largely open surgery or did laparoscopic surgery also play a role in colorectal cancers? So uh, surgery, as, as we know, has evolved over the last uh, two, three, four decades. Uh, so open surgery is always the standard. The technique is very standardized. However you do it, for example, in rectal cancer, uh, it's called total mesorectal excision. It's a very certain way of doing a particular procedure. So I think that has been standardized and that was standardized with open surgery. Now, in the last, say, 20, 25 years, keyhole surgery, which is now we call minimally invasive surgery. Uh, minimally invasive surgery was introduced primarily through laparoscopic surgery, where instead of making a big cut in the abdomen, we made smaller holes through which instruments were put in, like chopsticks, and where we removed a bit of colon or rectum or any part of the whatever we want to remove. And what it showed us is that we, uh, we also had a camera to look inside, so we had better vision and also less smaller cuts, less pain, quicker recovery. So there were benefits, added benefits apart from standardized cancer care. So that happened in the last 25 years. In the last decade or so, this technology has evolved into robotics and uh, maybe about 10, 12 years, robotics has really come into the fore. What it does is basically an advancement of the techniques of surgery or keyhole surgery in particular, where uh, you know, for example, keyhole surgery using standard instruments where like two dimensional, you know, instruments work like you pick up something and you have to stand next to a patient and then operate. Uh, in the robotics, I think the technology has changed where your instrumentations are miniaturized. Uh, they are uh, they articulated. We'll go into the details, but in the last decade or so, robotic surgery has taken surgery to another level where it is more precise uh, you know, and with better outcomes, apart from standardized cancer care outcomes. So coming to robotic surgery, I mean, I think uh, that people have heard of it now. It's kind of widespread enough for people to have heard of it, about it, but not many know exactly what it involves. I mean, people still ask whether a robot performs the surgery or is the surgeon doing anything at all? So could you give us a kind of an overview on what exactly happens in robotic surgery? How is it done? Yeah. So, yeah, it's a, it's a common misnomer that people think that, you know, robot is automated and, you know, you just put a robot in and they freak out. But actually, it's not. It's like a slave, uh, a master and slave concept. So we have a console, which is like a joystick, which I'm sure all, you know, most people know, you know, like a video game joystick, uh, which has got, you know, and you look into this console and you can see what's happening inside the abdomen. Now, next to the patient, there is a robot, which has got its four arms, through which a camera as well as instruments go in. Uh, these instruments are miniaturized and, and, uh, and they are docked next to the patient. Next to the patient, apart from the robot, there is an assistant who oversees what's going on. But the surgeon can, is away in the room, but slightly away. Now that's got implications for the future. Uh, many, many implications will go into it. So, but coming back to what this technology is, so every movement we do with the joystick, it is replicated inside the patient. And there are several uh, check mechanisms which are in place in the, in the uh, technology that without the surgeon making a movement, nothing moves inside the patient, right? Even if you're, you're distracted or take your head off, the whole thing freezes. So there is no automation. It is... It, 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 it augments the surgeon's movements. Uh, what the benefits are that you get a 10 times bigger magnification. Your instruments are, are basically like your wristed, you know, your hand wrist. The instruments are wristed so that they can go and, you know, go into very awkward areas or, or in the pelvis, for example, and do 
awkward moments as well as to do complex surgery. Uh, there is tremor filtration because normally when we are, we normally have tremor, you know, uh, and that is filtered because of the technology which exists. And uh, with all this, then the surgeon is also sat on a platform and is comfortable, you know, he's not stressed. So, you know, these cancer operations can last for five, six, seven hours, you know, depending on what type of surgery you do. But at the end of it, where you actually were the critical bit where you're cutting something out or, you know, you've done all it, everybody gets tired. Everyone gets tired. But if you're sat and you're comfortable, ergonomically, you're better because that's not been looked at for a very long time. And I think you're in a better frame of mind to do that critical bit at the end of a long operation. So I think that's where all this technology is coming into play. Uh, so coming to the cancer treatment in robotic surgery, uh, are all cancers treatable or what are some of the important common cancers that can be treated or is there something related to the stage as well? So uh, let, let's take colorectal cancer, for example, in India, uh, we don't have a screening program, you know, so generally what we see are these are bulky tumors which come at a stage three, stage four, compared to a Western population where there is a screening program uh, or, and, and once you, because once you start screening, you pick up things when they're early and they are smaller tumors, so which is much more easier to treat. But the way they present to us, particularly post pandemic, for example, everybody has been sitting at home and it's augmented the problem of patients coming at a later stage because there's no screening program, then they have not sought out help. So they think it's hemorrhoids, for example, for rectal cancer, because the symptoms are very similar, rectal bleeding, change in blood, you know. So I think that's where these issues are. Now, as far as robotics is concerned, anything which needs surgery can be done robotically. But obviously if it's an advanced cancer, which is stuck onto multiple organs or you know, it's very advanced, then open surgery is probably the safe way to do it. But as with more experienced team, as in our group, we have upper lower GI surgeons working together. We have a big, big group practice and we do a lot of these procedures. What we are doing is pushing the boundaries of what we can offer in emergency surgery, as well as complex procedures, even if it's stuck onto other organs, we are able to still remove it. So as a standard, uh, if it's advanced, open is better, but in general, most of the procedures can be done robotically. And does the fact that uh, would it, I mean, is it that, you know, like if somebody has uh, extensive radiation before the surgery and, you know, would that kind of distort the anatomy and does it at all affect the decision to do a robotic surgery or not? If you actually think about it, if it is with radiation it is more challenging, particularly a male pelvis, for example, is even more difficult because Women have a wider pelvis. That's because of evolution of having children, babies. You know, men have a narrow pelvis, as small as their brains, I think. Uh, so uh, what happens is, so if post-radiation, these tissues are, are edematous. Now, with open surgery, think about it. There is no place to put your hand to get that plane. With robotics, you have these instruments which are miniaturized and you can get into these planes. And once... As I, as I told you earlier, that the technique is the same. You're just using the technology and finesse of these instruments to get into these planes. And I find that if you can't do it robotically, you can't do it open because it's so challenging. And our, I, in the last 500 cases, I didn't have to convert because of a technical difficulty, only because of some instrument wouldn't get there, not because of technique. So I think you're right with radiation, there are changes to the anatomy, but I think with experience and with the technology, you're able to achieve, you know. So you're saying, in fact, robotic is in fact a more- Better, because you're seeing better, your vision is better, it's 10 times magnification, the instruments are smaller, and you can get into these very tight spaces. So um, what happens after a robotic surgery? Does the patient uh, uh, need to stay in the hospital for a long time or is the stay reduced uh, as compared to a conventional surgery? I mean, of course, they may have to stay on for chemo or other things, but then the surgical procedure itself, what kind of post-operative care is required? So with, with robotics, what we're seeing is one, patients have uh, less blood loss, less pain, there's quicker recovery, 
and and because the tissue handling is completely different and you know compared to even laparoscopy where we are very close to the operating field and we are not you know we are just the tissue handling is so much more better so the less tissue handling is done the recovery is also quicker so on an average we've seen that our patients post rectal cancer surgery stay in hospital for an average four to five days but because they come from out of town you know they're ready to go but they would rather stay another extra day you know what i mean so uh, on the whole we are seeing compared to open surgery the length of stay is less the the the, the, chance, the also the time taken to get back to routine work is also shorter less blood loss and so and also with more experience and quicker it gets the costs are also balancing out similar to uh, laparoscopic surgery at this point so which i think is you know reflects on the program uh, so are there any complications or any risks uh, for robotic surgery and the other thing that i wanted to ask you is yes we're talking about the gi and the colorectal but which other uh, i mean is it uh, now being done for cancers of you know the rest of the body as well like for example head and neck or chest yeah so the first uh, question was Sorry, I didn't get the first part. Of it. The risks and the complications. The risks, yeah. So with any operation, there are certain risks, uh, which are standard, you know, pain, infection, bleeding, which we all sanitize. With robotics itself, robotics itself, what you need to be careful is the training required to do it. And I think when initially when the uh, robotics was introduced, there were several people who wanting to jump onto the bandwagon. Most of them got trained, but a few people didn't get trained. And that's where, you know, these instrumentation technology is different compared to you know when laparoscopy was introduced it was the same you know problems once you were properly trained the risks are very very minimal or not existent because of the technology because it's so intelligent these systems these days there are so many check mechanisms which are there but obviously these are heavy arms and things so you need to handle tissue differently so once you learn that there are no robot specific complications at all it is mostly due to do with the technique or the surgeon's, uh, you know, uh, 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 training, you know, uh, if he's been trained properly to it. Now, the second part of the question was, Doc, the second part of the question was uh, uh, other that procedures. About, yeah, other, other cancers of other parts of the body. So uh, ro robotics was primarily introduced for uh, urology. So urology. it is the gold standard for prostate. People do extremely well. Uh, in Apollo, we have one of the busiest robotic prostate programs in the country. Of course, they use it for uh, kidneys and bladders. Uh, again, GI, sorry, GI. Again, we use it for colon, rectum, pancreas, uh, stomachs, esophagus. Uh, they, they've started you doing using the robot for donor hepatectomies. So it's not far where uh, some teams in the in, in this city are going to be using it for uh, liver transplants, uh, even for recipients. So I think we're getting there. And again, uh, it is used for pediatric cases, pediatric urology, um, and, and, and uh, gynecology, ENT, uh, pretty much everything, pretty much everything. And, and I think most useful is, and again, for anastomosis, intra, intracorporeal anastomosis, vascular anastomosis, cardiac, again, uh, is another beneficiary of, for robotic uh, uh, surgery. And again, we have a very busy robotic cardiac program at, at Apollo. So it is pretty much, you know, getting to almost every corner of every surgery. Uh, you were talking about pediatric surgeries. Mm -hmm. So is there any particular, uh, uh, I mean, do you think, I mean, because of the less hospital stay and pain, it must be even more beneficial for children, even on, a, on an emotional level and uh, post-operatively? Isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. I think I think uh, anything which reduces your length of stay is yeah. going to be, you know, at the end of the day, no one likes to be in hospital, including you and I. You know, yes, we love our work, but it is a space where you yeah. come in. And I think to, is a different, uh, yeah, it, it is it is a mindset. But again, patients in general are intrigued by this technology and how technology because I think in India. Uh, although we are late to get to the technology, once we get onto it, we are all, all, all of us, it could be phones or it could be anything which we use. People are really into technology and they are very, 
uh, receptive to technology and even children for that matter they, they're like oh really okay is it gonna they understand these days children have so much knowledge it is available on their phones you know so it's it's just fascinating so what do you think would be the uh, la i mean in this not a challenge but is there some barrier to this robotic surgery becoming the surgery in the future or is it really getting there especially in our country in our in our context uh, so the technology wise i think it's it's a no brain the patients come for again the program and if there is less pain quicker recovery costs are similar everybody's going to but the issue is going one of the major challenges has been the cost yeah. anywhere in the world because this technology is new and it you know somebody's got to pay for it uh, mostly i mean majority of the patients pay for it but again that's where our programs have come into play uh, driven by what we do is to one high patient volumes to also bring in the cost efficiency we use the robot for exactly what it does you know you you can avoid you know cost cutting by avoiding things which are unnecessary and you know i'll just put it there because you know you don't need to use the robot to grab something and hold because that you could use with an ordinary instrument what you needed to do that find the section deep in the pelvis or doing an anastomosis so but you know again more insurance is coming into play so they will provide packages and i think that's a amazing thing compared to even 10 years ago there are lots of more companies are getting enrolled for robotics surgery so that's good second competition is coming there's more companies which are making robots so the cost of the whole uh, capital cost goes down and then once there's competition the cost of instrumentation goes down for then surgeons are getting more experienced in it you know in, in our own program we've done about 500 of these personally and i could say from you know from the first 100 to the last 500 the time has come down the cost of using instrument and whole package cost has come down so i think all that will help in the future so uh, again as a uh, if there is you know a, a person a, a member of the public a lay person listening to this particular conversation uh, definitely they will understand that robotic surgery is so beneficial for cancer treatment but is there any uh, uh, in the sense that you know like how does a person like you know there is a diagnosis of cancer in the family what would your advice be uh, you know where how do they decide i mean the patient obviously may not be or their family may not be you know uh, the people to actually decide what kind of surgery a person is going to have uh, so what should they really do what would your advice be should they go to the uh, you know to the facility where these things are available or see the oncologist or see their family physician first so on a very practical level what would be your advice so uh, i remember about 10 years ago when when we there was a big hoarding of robotic surgery and you know uh, in front of a hospital because we introduced this technology way back then uh, and the public know that apollo will always be at the forefront of introducing new technology and it's always there the question is whether they need it that's what your question do i need it you know oh i, I know these facilities are well do i need it is it relevant to me i think it's a very very important question i think it goes back to creating awareness uh you know they could be having some rectal bleeding and they could be believing it's just hemorrhoids or piles and just ignoring it while you know oh i know that robotics is there or surgery advanced surgery is there, but do i need it yeah so i think that's why the creating awareness is so important so i think the the point of the uh, our, our conversation today yes we are highlighting these things but i think going back to the basics for example for colorectal cancer which is becoming very common even affecting young people as young as the 1920s uh any change in bowel habit rectal bleeding weight loss anemia for more than 6 weeks are red flag symptoms so if you have those symptoms then you should first go see your own gp your your doctor your specialist whoever and they should be clinically examined have a rectal examination done i think it's very basic every month we see patients who have been misdiagnosed or not had a rectal examination so once it's done because if we can pick these you know once the treatments available are fabulous we can we can completely cure this uh, uh uh you know uh condition so if they come in time 
that's what is more important. So if you have these symptoms more than six weeks, you just need to uh, get screened. So once you screen them, you will pick it up. Once you pick them up at an early stage, you can cure them. So some of the simple tests are like something like colonoscopy, which is a complete screen of your colon. You can pick it up. And good thing is if there are the early stage, like a polyp stage, you can remove them, avoid surgery. So that's why to have that awareness, get checked, get screened is so very important. Isn't it also uh, that you have to, uh, is the, are we mandating a screening colonoscopy? I mean, I know it's not part of, uh, I know in countries like America, I think it's done at the age of 45 or something, even without any symptoms. Is that something which people must also start veering towards? Mm -hmm. Or are there any risk factors that, uh, I'm sorry, I'm digressing a bit. No, no, it's important because uh, I think the are, context is important. Uh, we are seeing young people, you know, young Asian males are prone for rectal cancer, and that's uh, becoming an epidemic. So, any symptoms more than four to six weeks, I think that's a good start. Four to six, six weeks at least for symptoms which we just rectal bleeding, change in bowel habit, weight loss, anemia, we get screened. Family history of colorectal cancer, absolutely. So, if say mother, father had a colon cancer, rectal cancer at 60, you should, these cancers take about 10 years to develop. So you should get screened at 50. Uh, if you have cholera, if you have, your brothers and sisters should get screened, a patient, if a patient has, their brothers and sisters should get screened. So the siblings should get screened. You know, it doesn't go to the wife or the husband, but the children, they should get screened. So 10 years before when it was diagnosed is a, is a good uh, point to get screened. And somebody who's got ulcerative colitis for more than 10 years, they're at risk of developing. And some people have these polyp conditions where there are thousands of polyps which develop. And, and those patients should get screened too, you know, in the families. So that, that's very important and useful advice. And uh, before we go on to the, you know, where do you see the robotic surgery going in the future and what are the next advance, advancements, the next stage going to be? I also wanted to ask you this about, uh, are there any lifestyle changes that people must make so that these colorectal cancers uh, can be prevented uh, to some extent? Uh, so the most important thing is good lifestyle, which is going to be uh, to eat healthy, avoid red meat, uh, more veggies, exercise is very important, important. Uh, stop smoking, cut down on your alcohol, processed food it needs to come down. I know it's easy these days, uh, but I think healthy lifestyle is so very important. And if you are in any of these risk factors, which we mentioned, you yeah. should get screened too. Uh, so finally, tell us about, you know, what next? So interesting question because uh, we are placed amazingly well with this technology now next thing is where we're going to get virtual reality uh, virtual reality augmented reality uh, embedded embedded into the system so basically once you have your scans and mris or ct scan pet scan all this will come into when you look into your console they will get in, embedded into your you know when you look into it it will preemptively tell you, oh, there is a blood vessel there or a, a you know, an organ there, be careful. So that may be not so useful for, not useful for everyone, but for experienced surgeons, but particularly for people who are training, it will highlight, you know, that's where this technology is going. The second, second aspect of this is, uh, if we now currently have a console and a robot connected by a wire, but once 5G and 6G technology comes in, this thing could become wireless or super fast. And then we could be doing remote surgery. And then that opens up possibilities for our patient, particularly a big country like us, where we could get expertise. Uh, you know, it's taken 30 years for me to get to a level of expertise to do these operations procedures safely. So if we can extend this, uh, you know, expertise through remote surgery to the most distant parts of our country. And I think that will be an amazing thing. And I, it was bound to happen in the next few years. Is there anything else that uh, you would like to say? Any other uh, particular success story or anything that you would like to highlight in a bit to, to drive the point 
at home further that you know robotic surgery is uh, the future for cancer surgery so the one of the important uh, things which we are seeing is that reconstructive procedures but in rectal cancers where you have to take the rectum out it's very low you end up with a permanent colostomy or a bag and that could be difficult for patients socially uh, also for the work wise what we are doing more and more is to removing these rectal cancers and reconstructing them and we are able to do that with technology we're seeing it better we're getting very low into the pelvis and doing very very low anastomoses with this technology and so i think uh, what it is is augmenting our skill sets and it's helping patients avoid a permanent colostomy they may have a temporary one but a permanent colostomy for sure and i think also it is useful for nerve preservation which is not only are we achieving cancer out outcomes but that is part of the standard of care but also better functional outcomes by which what i mean is better urinary function because these nerves are because you see them better you look after them well you don't damage them because of this technology and the vision we're seeing and these are important for sexual function urinary uh, control and also you know uh, fear, motion control so so i think that's where this technology is really augmenting our skill sets absolutely so thank you so much dr vikdesh munikrishnan for this very thank very illuminating discussion and dear viewers i hope you found this session to be useful and informative so do put in any queries that you may have on either our facebook messenger or on facebook itself or in any of our social media channels or website we're always there to clarify to help you to seek uh, better medical care and also to answer your queries remember if your loved one is diagnosed with cancer or you're diagnosed with cancer all is not lost the realm of cancer care be it surgery diagnostics radiotherapy or chemotherapy or targeted therapy has made unimaginable strides in the last few years the best option is to be aware that these developments are happening and seek appropriate the latest and the best possible care so as they said cancer is a word not a sentence conquer it with determination knowledge and faith thank you namaste thank you dr